Sometime around the late 50s AD, two men, St. Paul and St. Luke, made their way for the very first time to Kos, from the harbour that once existed in this place. Hello, my name is Simon Peter Sutherland, and in this documentary, I'm revisiting Kos. Previously, I've explored the island from the perspective of St. Luke and how the beloved doctor was intrigued by Kos and Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine. In 2017, I returned to Kos with no absolute aim of making a film. But while I was there, things began to unfold. As I visited ancient sites and read the Bible, I became compelled to start filming again. Unfortunately, I had my camera with me to capture it all. I began to imagine what this visit must have been like for Paul, and how a man with such a strict Jewish upbringing dealt with dietary laws. This gave me a series of ideas. I began thinking about the events where Paul and Luke entered the town and attempted to reconstruct the details of the exact spot they landed and where they walked into the city and also the events that followed. To unpack my journey, I went back to a familiar place. This area behind me is the harbour of Kos Town. It was here where the Apostle Paul and Luke landed around 58 to 59 AD, as written about in Acts of the Apostles. For me as a Christian, when I stand here, the Bible is alive. As I walk through the harbour and through the modern streets, I see hints of the ancient world scattered here and there. At times, I feel like I'm walking in an outdoor museum. It's almost as though the Bible is walking with me. Although fragments of the ancient world are all around me, the modern town is vibrant, alive, bustling, and active with the smell of food, shopping, and entertainment. There are even old traditions and legends about the Apostle himself. One tradition says that Paul actually preached here. Behind me is the plain tree of Hippocrates. Local tradition has it that when Paul came off the ship here at Kos, he came directly to this area and proclaimed the gospel. This curious legend intrigues me and I'm eager to find out more. But I don't have to journey very far. This ancient tree is situated very near the actual ancient Agora. Archaeologists have uncovered the site and in New Testament times the harbour led directly to this marketplace where goods and trade would be delivered and sold. The word Agora comes from ancient Greece and describes an important central marketplace where merchants, ship owners, fishmongers, dressmakers and tradesmen would gather for retail and trade. It is also a place where food could be purchased. This Agora was the immediate go-to for ship owners, travellers and Roman officials. In Paul's day, it was the centre for religious and philosophical debate. I spent many hours wandering around this area and it is considered an ideal place for Paul. This area around and behind me is the ancient location of the Harbour Stowe. 
It was here where Paul and Luke came with the ship to enter into the ancient Agora. Centuries later, this location was converted over into a Christian basilica, which I would like to think commemorated the Apostles' visit. At the Agora, I noticed many temple remains and ruins, many of which are numbered by archaeologists. Thanks to a combination of earthquakes and archaeology, we can see more of the ancient world than has been seen for many a year. It is the type of place where even today, it isn't difficult to imagine the apostles walking around. The book of Acts tells us that Paul was not under house arrest at this point, so he was free to come and go as he pleased. Acts also implies that Paul was self-sufficient, and here I can imagine him seeking out the best place to eat. So for Paul to travel up just from the harbour, coming here to, the, to this ancient Agora, he's going to have his motives, and I suspect being on the ship for such a long amount of time, he's going to want to get off the ship and clear his head and then just come to the Agora and get something to eat. Now this is the place where the worship of gods was taking place and this is the place where trade and food was, was sold. So here he's going to need money. So him being on his third missionary journey, he's come from Thessalonica and Philippi and then along the way over to Kos, he's going to have some of the money which he's, he's picked up along the way. So perhaps even a coin like this, which is from Philippi of Augustus, from around the same time, this would uh, be a perfectly reasonable conclusion to make. Or perhaps this coin from Thessalonica, which is one of the coins which we believe is evidence for the star which was seen in the sky at the time of Christ's birth commemorated in this coin good candidate or perhaps this one with the head of this person on it you might know him Emperor Nero from around exactly the same time and here it is Nero's head this would be a perfectly good example of the type of coin that Paul would have used. Although the Bible is silent about any activity here, we know that Paul was in conflict with pagan gods on a number of occasions. In Acts 16, we read of how he was stirred by his visit to Athens because the city was given over to idols. When Paul visited Kos, the Agora was likewise home to idolatry and temples of other gods. This construction over and behind me is the 2nd century BC sanctuary to Aphrodite. Paul would have certainly been in conflict with this Sanctuaries to both female and male gods were central to the Agora. Here at the harbour, Paul would have stood face to face with the sanctuary of Hercules. In Greek mythology, Hercules was the son of Zeus. This would have been in direct confrontation with Paul's preaching that Jesus Christ was the only begotten Son of God. But the Greeks had their beliefs and their defences in place. When Paul came here, here stood an ancient fortification. It was built about 366 BC and it was not destroyed until about 142 AD 
when an earthquake came. So this certainly stood here in the Apostles' time. First century Kos was generally a peaceful place and rarely had any disturbances. In 53 AD, Kos town was made a self-governing free city and the island maintained a friendly attitude towards Romans. This is intriguing because Paul was a Roman citizen, which means when he visited, the new rule would have only been set in place five years earlier. So he would have been given friendly treatment. Paul would have certainly extended friendly treatment in return. Perhaps this is why ancient tradition offers a plausible insight into his proclamation of the gospel here at Kos. I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. It's amusing to think that while Paul was preoccupied with the saving of souls, Roman officials may not have been so busy. In 2021, archaeologists in Jerusalem uncovered a large collection of ancient Roman dice near the Western Wall. This offered insight into what people would do with their spare time. The research revealed that they played dice. Amongst all the workings of the Roman soldiers and officials, they used to have some time for leisure. Now these are Roman dice dating from the first to the fourth century. So they could be from the New Testament era. They're from Asia Minor. Now I have a theory that while the boat was moored, the Roman soldiers sat playing dice. For Paul, however, there doesn't appear to be any spare time. For him, the salvation of souls was at stake. He was a man on a mission, and every soul counted. The day of redemption was imminent. This is reflected in the history of the island. On my previous journey to Kos, I visited the site of an ancient basilica built over the location where ancient historic tradition claims that Paul visited during his stay at Kos. On this leg of my journey, I'm revisiting this intriguing place. Just outside the city of Kos, a few miles up, there stands a location which is archaeologically tested and even with contributions from the European Union that there is a place here where Paul visited on his third missionary journey. Now behind me up here you can see some of the ancient remains of this church which was founded in his memory. Here you'll find a baptistry and this 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 grand church which was established here. Now I recognize that it isn't in scripture but that doesn't mean that it never happened. I have drove back and forth to this area and I visited this spot about four times on separate occasions wandering through these these these, these fields in this place to, to try and uncover what this is all about. I'm still void of answers, but I've tracked that this place is just a few miles outside of Kos Town. And it would be easily for Paul to have come here. In fact, I, I walked more in one day around Kos Town than, than it would take for Paul to come here. Now my, my points would be that 
I cannot imagine him visiting ancient sites full of pagan idolatry and godlessness claiming to be godly without him attempting to see people saved and come to Christ I cannot imagine that so if these people here if there was a village here or something people call for him to come here come and visit us at Zipari if it was called that back in those days because that's what it's called now I cannot imagine him not coming and for him to travel what, eight kilometers in my modern route whatever whatever it was in them days because we don't know about anything about the road I cannot imagine him not coming to visit this place and I can't imagine the early church fabricating this because I've seen some traditions in in modern Greece concerning Paul and some of them are wild but this is not so wild this involves his character his mission his third missionary journey you know I'm a firm believer in the authority of scripture and you know where is this in scripture that type, that type of thing I'm, I'm a firm believer in that I, I hold devoutly to scripture but there's just something about this place which which just intrigues me and I doubt very much that this will be my final visit I don't know I don't know I like this place too much Personally, I don't think Paul saw any fruit from the gospel here. Kos was steeped heavily in its ways. But since the Bible affirms that Paul certainly visited Kos, I'm intrigued by the idea of a number of antique and modern biblical researchers that Paul and Luke had a special interest in the island given the association with Hippocrates. The ancient traditions are firmly grounded in the history of the island. Likewise, the idea that both Paul and Luke were intrigued with their visit to Kos has also been explored by a number of antique and modern faithful ministers of the gospel. In 1882, the Reverend William Kirk Hobart published his book, The Medical Language of St. Luke. This is a fine work of biblical scholarship and proves the Gospel according to St. Luke and the Book of Acts were written by the same person. Here, the author clearly demonstrates repeated uses of Greek medical terms common to two persons in antiquity, Luke and Hippocrates. The author reveals that Luke uses rare words peculiar to Hippocrates, which he must have inquired from learning. For many centuries, Biblical researchers, theologians and expositors have pondered upon the connection between St. Luke, Paul and Kos with Hippocrates. In this book written by Reverend Housen in the 19th century he says this, the Christian physician St. Luke who knew these coasts so well could hardly be ignorant of the scientific and religious celebrity of Kos. We can imagine the thankfulness with which he would reflect as the vessel lay anchor off the city of Hippocrates that he had been emancipated from the bonds of superstition without becoming a victim of skepticism which often succeeds it, especially in minds familiar with the science of physical phenomena. You can see that they have explored this, John Gill, to name but a few, have 
long pondered upon this connection between Paul, Luke and Kos and Hippocrates. And I'm intrigued by the connection as I've previously explored from Luke's perspective, this time from Paul's perspective, of how Paul coming into these ancient cities with all their diet and all their different regulations, clean, unclean hands, issues like that. How did he eat? What did he do? He, the, the law had to have been updated, otherwise Paul couldn't have brought the gospel to these places because he wouldn't have lived long enough because he wouldn't have been able to eat. He couldn't have taken the diet, the restrictive diet upon, upon ships and been absolutely starving on some occasions, absolutely starving. He wouldn't have pulled through. So it had to have been amended, it had to have been updated in some way to bring the gospel out into these, into these lands. So I'm long fascinated with this idea of, of Paul visiting this place with such a reputation of Hippocrates and what he taught and how this place was actually so overwhelmingly governed by, by his ideas and his medicine. Paul would have had to have fit in with that and Luke. Now that's what I'd like to explore. While on course and reading the Bible, I noticed something very distinct. Luke in Acts tells us that on this leg of the journey, Paul was determined not to spend time in Greece, but to arrive in Jerusalem to celebrate the resurrection and a feast known as the Feast of Pentecost. This got me thinking. At this feast, people ate food that is not dissimilar to the diet prescribed by Hippocrates. Today, we would call this menu superfood. Wheat, barley, grapes, figs, pomegranates, olives, olive oil, dates, and honey. A biblical diet, which was not only prescribed by God, it was done for reasons of healthy living. Reading this gave me an idea. We know from the New Testament that Paul was not against Jewish converts to Christianity, who continued to preserve the laws, but did not impose them upon the Gentiles. For Paul, the written law was for Israel, not Greeks. But the ancient cultures of the world often borrowed ideas from each other. And in the third century BC, the law of Moses had been translated into Greek. So by the time Paul visited Kos, the culture was already familiar with them. Realizing this got me thinking even more. What if these observations present a window for us to explore how Paul might have fit in with the people of Kos, an island where the diet, lifestyle, and ideas of Hippocrates dominated? Eager to find out more, and to experience for myself the ancient lifestyle, I decided to revisit the places where Hippocrates was born. It's truly amazing that Hippocrates was born here, because it's the type of place where, even visiting today, I just don't feel part of the world. You can see sections of the ancient city down in this lower region. I'm traveling to a distinct destination where locals have reimagined 
what life might have been like for those living on ancient Kos. Here, at Hippocrates' garden, the houses and lifestyles of the ancients have been authentically replicated. Just being here isn't difficult to find yourself lost in the simplicity and peacefulness of the ancient world. Something that in today's world is almost lost. So here they've replicated what ancient Greece might have looked like. You've got the ancient houses, ancient rooms. So you've got here probably a seating area, kitchen in there. And then you have, in here you have the bathroom. And you can see that they're actually quite up to date. It's a toilet and the bath and window up there for, for air and the doors. You can see they're quite, they're quite eloquent and, and also uh, feels like quite a good lifestyle. And you can see from this, from this house, which is replicating a standard house, ancient Greek house in the fifth century. And you can see they were actually quite advanced. In this area, they've replicated what the, the wine that the Greeks used to drink mixed. Now in here, you have a room that they've called the, the Andron, which is where the philosophers would meet in the evening and debate and talk and, and drink the mixed wine. But you can see that they're quite modern and this is what Paul would have been used to when he was reasoning with these people if he, if he ever visited their homes. The objects in this room, the, the types that they use for making wine, are the, the Bible doesn't condemn the drinking of wine, it just moderates it. But the ancient Greeks used to mix, as did the people in biblical times. They couldn't have drunk full wine in biblical times because if they did, they would have been drunk every day, which is hardly what the scriptures teach. So these, these objects here are essentially the types of things that were used from before the time of Christ. From the, the, the culture and the world that the apostles were speaking into. This room here is a replica of an ancient sleeping room or sleeping hospital where people slept to recover from illnesses. Apparently the Dreams of people were monitored to help people recover from their illnesses. But their dreams really spoke about what it was they were going through. I'm travelling back to Kos Town and the outskirts to see what life might have been like during the evening for Apostle Paul. I doubt, however, Paul would have had luxuries during his brief visit. Here in Kos Town, archaeologists have excavated, and in the evening, the atmosphere is glowing with modern lights. But I suspect for Paul, things might have been a little different. Where it was that Paul actually spent the night is, uh, a matter of much interest. He could have spent the night on the ship. He could have spent the night pitching his tent, perhaps. That would be a good, good candidate. He was a tent maker after all. Or perhaps if the tradition that he stayed at Sapari or visited Sapari has any credence historically then that would be a perfectly good candidate either way he 
he often faced danger at night. Things don't change that much. I went with mosquitoes even 2,000 years later. Mosquitoes, bites, creeping things. Who knows? Early in the morning, a favoured pastime of mine is to go out for a walk and sit along the coast. I often spend this time in contemplation. Ancient Greeks, however, would spend this time seeking for a nutritious seafood to be added to the menu. In ancient Greece, it wouldn't have been an uncommon sight to see people sat on the rocks by the coast fishing. This fish hook here is an ancient Roman fish hook from the time of the New Testament. You can see that it's, it's actually quite modern, quite up to date, or as a quite Roman. And People would attach this to their line, use a weight, often made of lead, and fish, and then eat what they caught. It's good food, it's healthy. The diet that Paul would have faced in ancient Kos and other parts of Greece would not have been disagreeable to him. In fact, it was a very agreeable and healthy diet and when viewing Paul from the perspective of his previous life as a Pharisee, it would not have been overly different to the food choices people have today, where the menu contained a variety of different foods. Kos is famous for the making of fine honey. Hippocrates taught that honey should be eaten regularly and boiled with vinegar. The Bible also promotes the use of honey as good for health. John the Baptist ate honey and Christ ate the honeycomb. For Paul and for Luke, the use of honey would have been a delight to them. Paul would have known the true meaning of the dietary laws of Moses and how God sought to benefit his people by the consumption of a proper diet. The dietary laws of Moses are contained in Leviticus 11. There are some manuals mentioned in this chapter of which their original identity is a matter of debate. But camels and swine, dead carcasses, the mole, mice, lizards and reptiles were forbidden, as were fish that do not have fins and scales, and birds such as the eagle, the vulture, the buzzard, the kite, the falcon, the raven, the ostrich, the seagull, and the hawk, the owls such as the short-eared owl, the little owl, fisher owl, screech owl, and white owls. Likewise the jackdaw, the carrion vulture, the stork, the heron, the hoopoe, and bats. Hippocrates held the belief that a nutritious diet was the best way to either cure illness or prevent it, and the restriction of red meat was all part of the diet of these Greeks. The dietary laws of Moses restricted the eating of meats. Anyway, they restricted pork, bacon, sausages, ham, 
and beef. But other foods were good, according to the law, such as oils and fish. Now, other restricted foods was the likes of, uh, by extension, lard, sunflower oil, corn oil, and some drinks, which even by extension today, such as coffee and alcohol, were again restricted. Now, the reason why God declared some animals to be clean and unclean partly is related to the culture and to the places where the animals dwell. So, in other words, if a pig just goes and roms around in the muck, then how can that be clean? It's going to infect the meat. It's going to it's going to have some kind of impact upon the meat. Now we know that it was God that was declaring these meats unclean. And is He not the Creator? Is He not the one who knows what is good for our system and knows what is good for the dietary system of His people? How would He not know? that certain animals were not good to eat. And this is where we have some of the, the points which really point to the insight of the Creator from such a long time ago, before modern technology, before modern science. Pigs contain a lot of bacteria. How did he know that? How did he know that? How did Moses write that if it wasn't inspired by God? Some of the foods not permitted in the law of Moses was meat such as pork and bacon, and by extension, sausages. Likewise, Seafood such as lobster and shrimp. Now shrimp are essentially bottom feeders and they feed off parasites, hardly a reliable source of food. And we know from modern science that over a hundred grams of shrimp per day is over the daily recommended amount. Now, foods such as this are very risky to eat because we know they cause heart disease and strokes. It's also caused problems such as high blood pressure, cholesterol, bowel problems, vitamin deficiencies. The question is, how did Moses know that? all them thousands of years ago. How did Moses know that unless the Creator revealed it to him? Now the good news is that there is food which was permitted. And this is all good food which the law of Moses declared to the people of God. Foods such as fish. Now that involves fish with scales and fins, such as mackerel, sardines, bass, they have scales, salmon, trout, perch, and so on. All of that is such healthy food, such a, a great diet, Mackerel contains a, a beautiful amount of oils. It's also good for deficiencies and things like that, it's, and maintaining a healthy heart. It's wonderful food. And then sardines, likewise again. Such a, such a, a beautiful food. Likewise, Foods such as 
birds. There's a few of them around this morning. Foods such as turkey, chicken, pheasant, grouse, quail. The Israelites, they ate quail. God provided it for them. Why? Would he provide them with bad food? I doubt it. Insects such as locusts, crickets and grasshoppers. We know that John the Baptist was, was uh, partial to that diet. Now all of this in some sense is consistent with Hippocrates as when Paul came here he he would have recognized that because Hippocrates said let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food you know it's just such a sad thing that if if only people would know that God is not against us living long and healthy. He isn't against that. He isn't a killjoy. There can be some of the greatest joys in knowing the Lord. And why would His holiness not include everything? Why would His holiness and His will for our lives not include things that He's presented, not modern, foods which are the likes of junk, trash, fast food that our world presents to us today. It's killing us. It's killing our children. Hospitals are full of people who are dying because they're eating modern worldly food. If only people would listen to the ancient law that was written so long ago and again not for salvation it's the way that God wants us to live he wants us to live a good life not under bondage there's no bondage in good food there are aspects of the law which were centralized around the theme of holiness holiness for the people of God. He wanted his people to push and attain perfection. Why would he disinclude diet? Diet is cultural as well. We, we, we dine, we eat with people. It's very much a cultural issue. What, would, what it essentially was in its original setting was concerning the separation of his people from the world. Now the big question comes in biblical understanding and exposition is well, is this relevant to Gentiles? Are you trying to bring us under the law again, which was dealt with by Christ? They're good points, fair points. But often these, these issues come from understandings which relate to Paul and his dealings with the Greeks. And likewise, we have the passage from Peter where the Lord said, that which God has cleansed you must not call common. So the issue which relates to Paul and his dealing with the Greeks and the foods and the foods that they ate. People today is a common misunderstanding to think that well that means you can just eat bacon, pork, all of these foods which, which God had already spoken against. The Greeks ate all that kind of food. The Greeks were eating this, that, and all these red meats and, and stuff like what people eat today. But in actual fact, that, that isn't true at all. The Greeks, by research, we know they only ate about two kilos of meat per year. Now you can say today, well, you, you, you know, that would be attempting to bring us under the law which Christ has redeemed us from. 
fair point. It's not a salvation issue. It's not an issue that says, well, if you eat red meats, you're going to go to hell. You'll perish. You'll be taken out of the kingdom or something like that. That's not the issue. It won't keep you out of heaven. He just might get you there a little bit quicker. Some of the fishing that was done in New Testament times was done from boats. They used nets like they did in the Gospels. They attached weights to the nets and they dropped them down in the sea and that's because of the stocks. The stocks of fish were so huge in the ancient world because the seas weren't overfished and people could literally drop a net into the water and sometimes pull out huge amounts of fish. This is communicating the Gospels although in Galilee at the time, the stocks were, were decreasing. Now the Romans ate other seafoods such as eel and urchin and cuttlefish and uh, a lobster. But most of the ancient Jews from that time would have abstained from foods like that such as the lobster and so on. But I can't get past this image of the fish used in early Christianity. I see it everywhere. Obviously when it was used by the early church it was a representation of Christ who was the ultimate great fisherman and, and then obviously Peter who who he commissioned. But today you see the the use of abuse to the ocean. Great abuses to the ocean brings mercury poison in of certain types of fish. You didn't have that in the ancient world. So today we can conquer that by eating small foods like sardines because they don't absorb mercury in the same in the same amount as the larger fish, tuna, food like that is, is actually too much of it contains the mercury. And that's a problem of, of our modern world of pollution and corruption. Humans are spoiling the earth and spoiling what God had originally created and it's it's having its effect on us all. It's killing us. The world is killing us. My time here at Cos is almost done. Soon, I will be ready to head back to England. My prayer is that for those who do not know Christ, you will soon find him. That you too will search out the Bible and see for yourself the historical and spiritual value. That you will learn to realize that some things in life are beyond us. And life is not all about the past, the present, or the future, but about facing death, something that even Christ himself went through and rose from the dead. Back to the harbour, I found myself contemplating what exactly happened when Paul and Luke visited this island, but I suspect I may never truly know this side of eternity.